Good morning. And at home, I start out and say, good morning to the greatest group of people in Mississippi. And I can't say that here, so I'll say good morning to the greatest group of people that I know of in Washington. How's that? So it is good to see you today with our study of spiritual warfare. Had a lot of positive comments and interest that was expressed to me yesterday about this subject matter. And, and I find that to be true all throughout the country. As I mentioned, I, do, I teach a graduate class on this at Sunset, and I wrote a little book. It's called A War to Be Won. That you can, it's a Bible study class book, so it's broken into 13 chapters with questions at the end. It's available through Sunset. You can get online to the Sunset Bookstore, or if you wanted to take down my number, and you could text me, and I'll, I'll send you one, whatever, if you have an interest in that. But this has been a major focus of my study through the years. In fact, I am just at the end of completing a novel, and I know that's probably odd to hear from a preacher, but uh, I've loved C.S. Lewis, The Screw Tape Letters, and I've read some of the more contemporary things about spiritual warfare that are written from a fictional perspective, that, and they've been somewhat intriguing but frustrating to me at the same time. Like, for instance, the Left Behind type novels, and most of them are written from a very different perspective in regard to millennial reign and some of that rapture that we wouldn't believe or ascribe to. So I endeavored a few years ago to start something that would be interesting and expand people's minds under the understanding that it is indeed fictional. And I'm just, I think I'm in the last two chapters now finishing it up. And it's about an angel and his perspective from the spiritual world as he's protecting a Christian and trying to get a Christian through life as his protector, assistant, helper. And I, my big objective was just to weave in language that gave a, a sense of what the spiritual world, and this is the key word, might be like. Because where I won't go with this is to make leaps and say, well, I see this hint in Scripture, this hint in Scripture, this hint in Scripture, therefore this must be true, that's really my guess. I, I won't do that. So you'll hear me say, well, like for instance, yes, does your dog ever bark at nothing? And then you heard me say, well, maybe he doesn't. But I said maybe. <laughs> because we can't say, I, I'm not, just not willing to do that. On the vague things of Scripture, I'm not willing to go to the point. I'm willing to ask questions and maybe be comfortable with not having all the answers. And maybe be aware that there could be things happening that I don't see or understand. But I will not take the leap to assertively say, prophetically, I know this to be true. So this has been a great interest of mine. Um, like I said, if you have an interest in the book and like to text me, ask me afterwards. Or if you have an interest in any of the seminars. I do three or four a year as my church schedule allows. Uh, I'd be interested in talking to you about that as well. We are now going to start talking about the and nature of Satan. And I do have the last couple slides since we didn't get through everything yesterday, kind of at the beginning point of this. As I mentioned, I'm greatly concerned by our perspective in regard to the devil. Because I think that our theology has been framed more, our basic theology, not what we would verbalize, but what we kind of demonstrate through our day-by-day -day belief system has been more influenced by George Lucas than by the Apostle Paul. And what I mean by that is that I love watching the Star Wars films. I think it's great fantasy. However, it presented a religious system, whether you realize it or not. It presented an Eastern mystic religion that is similar to Buddhism, Confucian thinking, that, you know, all life, all creatures are part of one symbiotic life force. That's where you got the idea of the force. And that in that you find the power of good and the power of evil, like the yin and the yang, that are opposite but equal to one another. Now, there's a number of problems that come in with that when we begin to, not verbalize, but begin to act like that is how the spiritual world works. Because number one, it puts Satan on par with God. 
He is not. And we're going to expose that today when we talk about the origins of Satan from Scripture. It, 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 what a blasphemous thing to even insinuate that Satan is in any way co-equal but opposite with God. But it also kind of makes the whole idea of warfare and supernatural power very impersonal. Because what it causes us to think is that, just like in Star Wars, you know, it's just around us. It's just everywhere. And that may seem personal in the sense that we would all be connected to it, but it's impersonal because it's not about personalities. It's about some force. But the spiritual war is not just forces of good and evil. It's forces of good and evil that are being pushed and communicated by personalities of good and evil. By persons. God is a person, like we talked about last night. God has motivations. He has likes. He has hates. He has the things that he loves and the things he despises. God has tendencies. He has motives. He even, in a sense, and this makes us uncomfortable to say, but I think it's accurate to say that God even has needs. Now, understand, I've got to give a disclaimer because somebody's going to write me up in a bulletin for that. God does not have needs in order for his survival. I need that woman who shared a life with me for 30 years. I need her. But if she passed tomorrow, I would survive. I would still have food. I would still have a roof over my head. I would still have water. But my life would be diminished. Do you understand? We, we all have things we say we need that aren't necessary for our continued survival. They're necessary for the quality of our continued survival. So when I say God even has needs, it's not the needs for, he doesn't need anything outside of himself to exist. He has existed before anything existed. He is before time began, he is eternal in every way. There's no power outside of himself that is greater or limiting to God. However, God clearly had a reason to go through all this misery, as we talked about yesterday. And the reason, the only explanation when you think about the big question of why is that our God already had angels and it didn't satisfy his need. He, already, he could have created anything. But the one thing he had to create was the one thing that had the potential to break his heart. Not just the potential, the likelihood, probability, and reality it, we would break his heart. And I don't mean a little bit of broken heart. I mean... 6,000 years of broken heart that continues every single day today. And why would God do that? Because in his person, and we're made in his image, you know, this is interesting, but we try to understand ourselves at times by examining how God is, knowing we're made in his image, but wouldn't that mean we also could understand God by examining ourselves? We don't do that. That sounds a little bit like, oh, well, we would never want to. God is not like man. Yes, God is like man in some ways. Because we were made like him. So the fact that I need her, maybe that has something to do with the biblical metaphors of the bride and the bridegroom. Or maybe the fact that I need my kids for quality of life has something to do with the fact of God using the metaphor that he is our father and we're his children. Maybe even the idea of the we're his adopted children is unique in that way. Because I have a little niece that's adopted. I guess she'd be my, she's my cousin's daughter. I don't know what that is. I mean, down in Mississippi, that's called sister or something like that. So, but it, when my cousin's daughter is adopted from China, they had four boys and they couldn't, you know, they just couldn't seem to have a girl. They wanted one. But when you have four kids already, you're not going to get an adoption approved in the United States. So they went to China. And, you know, in China for years, because of the one child policy, everybody was keeping boys and putting daughters up for adoption. So there were just orphanages filled with them. And they went over there and Val, her husband, had to pick out out of a book of thousands of little girls had to pick. So they picked one. They went over. He walked into the orphanage. There were all these. It was the most heartbreaking thing because he said there were all these little girls who just looked so discouraged that they weren't the one. And then here she is. They had her in a new dress. She had her suitcase in her hand. 
and she was bouncing up and down. She was meeting her daddy. And he picked her up, and they brought her home. Her name was Morgan. A couple years after that, we were at a family function. She was sitting on my dad's lap, talking to him, and she was a little girl, you know. And she looked up, and she said, Uncle Stan, can I tell you a secret? And he said, well, sure, Morgan. What, what is it? She said, you can't tell my brothers, though. Mom and Dad said, I can't tell my brothers. And he said, okay, okay I won't tell your brothers. Special Uncle Stan. And he said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean you're special? Well, I know you're special, but what do you... She said, well, my, my mom and daddy told me that they love my brothers because they are their children, but they said I'm special because they chose me. You see, even the fact that we're his adopted children, just like we talked about last night, we're chosen. How glorious is that? Doesn't all that speak to a God who has a powerful personality and desire for love? On the other side of the coin, we have the devil. And as we talk about his origins, we're going to talk about his motives too. And the devil, his very essence is spiteful, it is selfish, and it is corrupt. And that is his person. And I'm telling you, it's more real when you realize it's not the yin and the yang, the force, good and evil. It is two personalities, one that is absolute love and desire, just yearning, almost begging you to love him back. And another that hates that one, that is powerless to hurt him, so he's just going to hurt his kids. Now that is more real than this dark side of the force. So as we study through and we talk, it's, we'll start off with kind of the slides we didn't get to last time. Why are we at war? We discussed this briefly. Satan's motive, very plainly, is to wound God in the only way that he can, by wounding his children. And you know, yeah, I mean, if, if you just wrap your mind around this, and then examine it. Like we said, sometimes we can understand God by understanding ourselves. You look at your children and you know that every person who loves their kids as they should, they would take any hurt or hardship so that those children didn't have to take it. Interestingly enough, God did that too. Didn't he? So that they didn't have to take it. And so we, we get this. Satan can't hurt God, so he strives to hurt you. All humanity. And it's in every war, the conflict is fought over an immensely valuable commodity that both sides crave. And folks, I have to remind myself of this literally all the time. I can be an impatient man. And when I'm in traffic, I can also be a little bit too quick. My wife preaches at me about that very thing. And so there are times when somebody cuts me off or when they're honking at me, I have an attitude about it. I never return gesture for gesture, so at least I'm <laughs> beyond that. But I, I get quite frustrated about it, and my wife will have to tell me. But it's so, it's so important to remember that that person who is most likely being controlled by Satan that person is the objective. And of everything God cares about, He really only cares about one thing, and that is me and that person. And his kids, and his wife, and my neighbor, and that fellow at work that mistreats me, and that boss that's impossible to deal with. Or when you're standing in the line, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but not long ago, I was in a hurry, and I was at Walmart. And I should have done the self-checkout, but I'm in the line. And the lady in front of me, she seemed like a sweet lady. She seemed like she, she kind of seemed down and out a little bit. She had a big grocery order. She, they ring it all up. I wait for 10 minutes or whatever till they ring it all up. And then she had one of those cards that the state gives people to help them with their groceries. And she went to pay, and she was like $4 short. And the lady said, oh, well, what do you want to take off? And so she chose what she was going to take off. And she said, I'm going to have to ring it all back up again. And I'm reaching in my pocket for $4, you know. But I didn't have any cash. 
it, 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 I was like, oh, well, can I use my card? And I even offered, and the lady said, no, we can't do that because of the, you know, it'd be two cards and you can't combine them. And it wasn't until after I got my card, I mean, and I'm upset and I'm fuming. I didn't say anything ugly. I just, you know, standing there gritting my teeth and can't, can't people do math? You know, that's the kind of thing I think. Bring a calculator with you, figure it out before you get up there. But then in my car, it hit me. I don't know if that na lady knows Jesus. But Jesus knows her. And everything going on in that store, she was more important to the creator of all things than anything else. You see, spiritual warfare, when you understand the motives, what it's all about, it changes your perspective on so many things. Even your perspective on people. And so, understanding this concept of exactly what this war is about is essential for us to actually fight the war. Because then we know what to fight about. You know, I live in the South, and all this political stuff is really, really exaggerated down there. Particularly anything that has to do with guns. Oh my goodness. I bet you, we have about 250 on Sunday now. Much more before COVID, but about 250 on Sunday now. And I think there's probably 285 guns in the morning. <laughs> because, you know, you got to carry a backup. <laughs> we have a 95-year-old. She's a 44 Magnum in her purse. No lie. <laughs> I mean, it's a big deal to people in Mississippi. And, and they are always, and I'll see brethren with these. Try it from my cold, dead hands. And if I'm close to them. And, and this actually happened when I was in Arkansas. I, had a, we had a, I preached a lesson, and I was talking about submission to the government. You want to talk about an absolute biblical doesn't go over well in the United States? <laughs> because we're a nation that... I, I, I'm a patriot. God used everything that's happened for His glory. No, no writing me up in the bulletin over this, please. But it's... It, right? We rebelled against our governing authority. And so we are a nation with a spirit of rebellion. We, we, we have to fight that as Christians. Because Peter told them to to Nero, who was stringing them up and lighting them on fire to light parties. That's, that's, that's a for Americans. It's tough. I was preaching and I was talking about some of this. And I'm, I live on a little farm and I deer hunt and I I even carry a pistol a lot of times, and I like those things, but I don't like them more than I like my faith, and I don't like them more than I like people, okay? That's just the truth of it. But when I was talking about this, trying to give some balance, I had an older brother at church who came up to me afterwards, and he had the finger out. You know that? Every let me have it because preacher, they come and take them from me. They'll pry them from my gold dead hands. And it just so happened that Two people over standing there was Blake, police officer. And I said, what if they send Blake to take him? Your brother. He said, he won't be going home. That brother did repent and tell me he was wrong later when he thought about it. But you see, we get in those kind of fights. What a distraction. When what we should be concerned about are the people. That's what this war is about. It's about people. And really nothing else in the end matters unless it has something to do with whether or not we can win people. That's what matters. And so as we consider this war, in every war, conflict is fought over an immensely valuable commodity. Both sides crave it. God craves because he craves for us. But Satan craves us to deny him that love. That's their motives. One fights to keep it, and the other side fights to take it. Now, this is interesting. We miss this big time. In every conflict, there is an, an offense and a defense. I mean, y'all still watch football up here, right? That's our second religion where we live. But I was familiar with it. You've got offense and you've got... And 
to try to defend and protect, and the other one is to try to advance and to take. That's the basics of offense and defense in sports or in war. And usually there's an aggressor and one who is defending. And in war, that's pretty much always the case. But what's intriguing about this is I think we get this mixed up. Who is the aggressor and the defender in the spiritual war? Well, let's think about it. We typically, even though, again, it's not something we verbalize, but the way we act, we typically would assume that we're on the defense. Right? Because Satan, he's got the whole world. And he's attacking us. Is he attacking us? All the time. I mean, every day. Every time we turn on the TV or our radio or listen to a podcast, every time we read a book, every time we go to school, every time we work, we're being attacked. It can feel like we're on the defense. But is that what the Bible describes? Think about the book of Matthew chapter 16. You remember when Jesus is talking to his disciples and he asks them, who do people say that I am? And they say, some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father which art in heaven. And I tell you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now listen to the next phrase. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'm a historian, and I can tell you I have never, ever, I, I particularly like military history and I have never read of any army in the history of the world that went out on campaign and carried their city gates with them. They took trebuchets and siege ladders and catapults. They took battering rams. They took archers. But you do not take on the offense your gates. Why? Because city gates are the last line of defense. So when Jesus is talking about the very institute, the introduction to the church, he says, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Who's he describing as being on offense there? And who's he describing on the defense? But yet we have a circle the wagons mentality in the church, don't we? You know, that imagery, the old West of circling the wagons and, you know, the Native Americans are attacking from all around. And so the settlers, they, to protect themselves, they just gather in as close and as tight as they can. I mean, there are churches all over America that that's what they're doing. They're circling the wagons in a defensive posture. And you say, but how could we be on the offense? We are so few. I don't know. SEAL Team 6 doesn't seem to bother them. And, and there's some really interesting parallels there, are there not? Because they're behind enemy lines. They're the best equipped and the best trained. They are the ones who are absolutely committed. Ours is not to reason why. Ours is but to do or die. They are elite, advanced force, behind enemy lines, taking the fight directly to the gates of the enemy. And that's all God has are special forces. That's all he has. That's all he has. Behind enemy lines. Sojourners in foreign soil. I mean, how many passages indicate that? But yet we're surprised when wicked people act wicked. Have you ever noticed how Christians are just shocked? There is nothing Washington can do or pass that should shock you. No, I'm serious. There isn't. Because when wicked people act wicked, that's like when fish swim or birds fly. You know, birds fry. I should have said fish fry. But, I mean, that's what wicked people should be expected to do. But it blows us away. Do we forget where our home is, where our citizenship is? Do we forget what patches are supposed to be on our shoulder? Do we forget we're behind enemy lines? You see, we don't need to circle the wagons. We need to start acting like the special forces we are. And folks, the Bible tells us that we have great weapons of war that are better than the enemies. We're better equipped. 
We have forces on our side that may be fewer in number, but are greater, of greater quality. So we need to fight. All right. Mankind, the most precious commodity. Souls are of such great importance and value that Satan will expend every resource. He does not care. He will spend every dollar. He will use every governmental force he can to retain control of us. In my little novel I'm writing, that's, that's kind of the basic idea. Is everything from his perspective uh, I'm trying to frame as it's just all about people. I mean, there's no interest in, I mean, if, it, it, this is also kind of interesting to me. I, I kind of imagine it and I framed it that Satan spends all of his energy on Christians. And, and I hear people all the time say things like, yeah, those, those Washington, the devil's eaten up with him. I don't think so. I mean, why would he waste energy on something he already has? I mean, that just doesn't strategically make any sense, does it? What are they just going to, if he leaves them alone, they're going to magically, I need to be a Christian. Well, the Calvinists would say that, but that's not true. How can they hear without a preacher? I mean, if we don't ever go to them, they're just going to stay in a lost situation and continue in their own depravity because Satan is not the only source of temptation. Your own flesh is a source of temptation, the Bible tells us. So once he gets the ball rolling, he can just let you go on your own. And you'll continue to be tempted and continue to sin and continue in depravity. So, folks, I'm telling you, I believe that every single minion of Satan is working on us. Every single one. That strategically is the only thing that makes sense. So every evil thing in this world thereby serves but one purpose. To turn mankind from God and to separate the Father from the love of His heart. What is our motivation then? How do we see people? The banker, the housewife, the homeless, the rich, the poor, the man, the woman, the homosexual, the LBT, all those letters. I mean, how do we see people? Folks, people are precious because because they are the pearl of great price for God. Now, He wants to be the pearl of great price for us. But they are His pearl. That's why we always say, well, you know, what can we give God? You know, we want, uh, Brother Mark talked a little bit about giving this morning, and that's great. And we need to do that because that's part. You see, just like I mentioned in the Old Testament tithing, that was about relationship. See, when I give, I have to think about Everything I have comes from you. And it builds that relationship. So that giving is very, very important. But when it comes to the spiritual war, giving of our time and our effort and our hearts are important. But you know what the greatest gift you can give God is? The greatest gift is you can take somebody to Him with you. You want to make Him happy. Give him what he wants the most. Those are the best gifts, right? What somebody really wants. And you know what God wants more than your money? He wants your kids. He wants your wife. He wants your neighbor. We need to present him with precious gifts on his return. And oh, the joy that would bring to his heart. So what is our motivation? All right. Misunderstanding God. And I had this at the end of the previous material that we didn't get to, but I mentioned a lot of it last night, so I'll just breeze through it quickly. But 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 22, the Apostle Paul understood this very well in his spiritual maturity. He says, The necessity is laid upon me, yet woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Listen to that. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. For I have become all things to all men that I might by any means win some. Now Paul does not mean he's going to compromise the truth. Because it's all about people's souls. But he will compromise other things. He won't compromise anything that hinders the primary objective. Which is to win people. And if you don't have the truth, you don't have anything to win them to. But he says, I'll, I'll, I'll be, to a Jew I'll become a Jew. To a Greek I'll become a Greek. I mean, I imagine the Apostle Paul... 
would be kind of like some of us preachers. Back in the early, my kids eat everything because when they were little, it was still the years where people had the preacher over all the time. And I just wasn't going to have kids that embarrassed me at people's house by saying, well, I don't, I don't like this. So my kids, now they eat everything. But I can remember some doozies, right? I like hot dog soup. I had a guy who invited me over to critique my sermons every Monday. And his wife made me hot dog soup. It's not as good as it sounds, and it doesn't sound very good. <laughs> but, you know, I can just imagine the Apostle Paul, he would, he would chomp down that hot dog soup, wouldn't he? You know why? Because the soup don't matter as much as the person who made it. You know, he, I don't know what kind of things the Apostle Paul liked to do. I, I like to fish, and I like to hunt, but I hate to ice fish, but I've went with people before, and I fell through. That wasn't a good thing. <laughs> But you know, if my neighbor, that doesn't happen in Mississippi, back in Michigan it did, if my neighbor asked me to go again, I'd grit my teeth and say, I'd love to, right? Uh, think the Apostle Paul would do that? You know why? Because it was about giving those gifts to God. He was passionate because he loved God. You see, you don't have to like everybody in this world. In fact, it's probably okay to dislike most people in this world. But you have to love them because you love him and he loves them. What makes mankind so special? We talked about this verse, the verse, the why of existence. That God, this life is a test. It's a test because God has the classic problem of all kings throughout history. You remember in the Old Testament, some of the kings like Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, when they'd have a dream, they wouldn't tell their viziers and their magicians what the dream was. Why is that? Because they knew if they told them what the dream was, then they were going to interpret the dream based upon what they thought the king wanted to hear. You realize that's always been, a king is probably the loneliest person in the world. You know why that is? Everybody wants to be their friend, but nobody's really their friend. It's all about what people can get from them. Can you imagine how exacerbated that would be for the creator of the universe? Why is there evil in this world? God hates it. But the only way you can choose to love him is if you have another option. And that's just the truth. So life is a test. Quick comment upon that idea of life being a test. I mentioned at the beginning of yesterday that I had that terrible experience with that person thing, whatever it was, at my very first ministry job. And I stayed up all night that night and prayed, and I was scared, and I even kissed my wife goodbye, and I was crying, and I hadn't told her everything going on, and she was freaked out that next day, because I honestly, the guy had told me he had a gun, by the way. But yet, in the course of conversation, I struggled with, What's my motivation here? What's my motivation? Do I love this man? And so I decided and I prayed, Lord, if this is my last day on earth, I just can't live the rest of my life wondering what I love more. Stayed up all night, cried, went the next day. It ended up turning out fine and I never saw him again. But you know, all of my life, from that day at 22 years old till now, when I get to start to doubt myself, and I know my weaknesses and I know my shortcomings, but when I begin to doubt myself, I remember that on the hardest day of my, not, of my life, I chose God even knowing or thinking, and it, I may not have been in any danger at all, but I thought that I was, even thinking I might lose my life for it. And so I know I love him. Not like he deserves to be loved, but I know I love him. And I'll tell you, I've never had anything like that since. And I won't say I've had a charmed life, but I've had a blessed life. Because I think God knows, and I think God saw that I passed the test. Life is a test. My son is preaching now at 22. When he was in high school, he was preaching at different churches on Sunday mornings. And he had his little girlfriend that he'd met at school, and he loved that girl with all of his heart. He taught her, and he baptized her. 
they went off to Christian college together, both on uh, athletic scholarships. And he, I mean, they, he was talking about when we get married someday, when we're a preacher's family, and he's a Bible major at school, and he gets off to school, and she kind of gets involved with some of the other athletes, and she's a sweet girl. We still love her, but she got to struggle because my son was an athlete, but he couldn't go, wouldn't go to the places on the weekends that the athletes went, wouldn't spend time in the activities they did because he was trying to live as a Christian. He was a Bible major, looking forward to being a preacher, so it was kind of lonely, but his girlfriend was struggling with the peer pressure. And finally, after several weeks of squabbling, she just laid it on the line. I don't want to be different than everybody else. I don't want, I don't want this preaching life. You can either be a preacher or you can have me. My son called me eight times a day for four months. Here, this big, strong college football player crying his eyes out on the phone. And he chose to be a preacher over the girl he loved. And you know, I told him in those conversations, I said, son, I promise you this. God is faithful. He keeps his promises. And here's the motto of our family. I said, remember what I've told you since you were five years old. If you be all about God, God will be all about you. Folks, I believe that with all my heart because it's about relationship. Isn't that awesome to know in our weakest moments that all God wants from me is relationship? That's what He wants. And I said, son, remember our words. Our words. Our family words. If you be all about God, God will be all about you. I said, son, just show him. And I know it's so hard, but you're saying, God, I love you the most. I choose you, even though the thing over the thing I want the most in this world. And you know, that boy is 22 now. He was 18 at the time. And maybe it's just luck, but I'm a spiritual warfare guy. I read more into stuff than that. It seems like everything that boy touches turns to gold now. His wife now, he met another girl. Well, he'd known her, but... She is, oh, she's, she's a pretty girl. And she is so godly and loves the Lord with all her heart, come from a great Christian family, wanted to be a preacher's wife. He went and started applying at little preaching jobs. She wanted to be out close to her family, started getting offers right there in the back door of where she wanted to live for a few years. They treated him better than I've ever seen a church treat a young preacher. They, went, uh, they got married, went on their honeymoon. The church helped them with their honeymoon and told us, y'all don't worry about that. We just want to be good to them. It, I'm telling you, everything the boy touches turns to gold. Kind of like somebody comes in and sins and then they leave twice as rich as they came. Remember a story like that? Because here's the thing. Life is a test. Pass the test. Pass the test. God doesn't want you just to struggle through life. The struggle is for the purpose of seeing what is in your heart. That's what it said in Deuteronomy 8. To know what is in their heart. So when the test comes, lift your heart. Lift your eyes and say, Lord, that's just hard, but no matter what, I'm going to do what shows you that I choose you. I tell you, you want to look forward to a life of blessing. Pass the test. It's kind of not on spiritual warfare, but it's really important. So, so life is a test. What does God want us to pass? We talked about Genesis chapter 20. This also explains the limitation of miracles. Now, I'm going to talk about this because I, it's a, this class is about perspective. And I believe that our membership has a very poor perspective on the spiritual world and the scheme of redemption and God's plan and the why of it all. And I'll explain. So, I hear brethren say things that I think, I don't think they through. Like, for instance, I hear Times say, well, I can't wait to get to heaven. I just can't wait to talk to the Apostle Paul. And you know what's assumed in that? That the Apostle Paul is more important in the kingdom than you. I mean, that's what, that's what is assumed in that statement. Or more significant than you. He's not. I don't say this arrogantly, but Mark is just as important as the Apostle Paul. In fact, this is going to really, again, don't remember up in bulletins. Listen before I, I, while I explain it. In fact, the Bible kind of indicates in some ways, Mark and Ken, Glenn, and Hi, may be more important. And I'll tell you why. 
they live in a more important time. Did you know that? We kind of think we live in this inferior time. Because we live in this time when, well, there's no miracles and we don't have any prophets and the Bible's not being written. Yeah, that's true. But are those indications that this time is inferior to that time? How about we just go by what the Bible says? How's that? So Matthew chapter 11, 7 through 15. That is talking about John the Baptist. And you remember, John the Baptist, he was so faithful beheaded by Herod, he sends some of his disciples to say, are you the, really the one? I guess he needed reassurance. There's all this discussion. Jesus says, who did you come to see? A reed shaken by the wind and all that. But then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, of all those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Now, that's interesting because that's a pretty long list. Abraham, David, man after God's own heart, Daniel, the only Bible character I know of that no negative word is said about. I mean, that's a pretty long list. Why is John the Baptist the greatest? But then he says something really interesting. But he who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know what that means? I'm just going by what the Bible says. The Bible says that the person who is a member here at this congregation or at Puyallup or wherever you worship who struggles the most who is struggling with alcohol addiction or pornography, but still drags themselves. The person who is wrestling with their marriage or trying to get control of their temper. The person who's struggling to be a Christian, least in the kingdom of heaven, greater than John the Baptist, who was greater than David, who was greater than Abraham, who was greater than Daniel, who was greater than Moses. That's what the Bible says. Not just the Bible, that's in red letters. And I know some of you are looking at me with a blank expression like that. Because greatness is not about perfection, folks. It's never been. Because none of those people were perfect either. In fact, they were really flawed. I mean, you could look back and say, well, Paul was so great. How about David? Was he great? The Bible said he was the man after God's own heart. But I promise you, you go listen off your sins and listen off his sins, you'll feel pretty good about yourself. Because it's never been about that. John the Baptist was greater because John the Baptist had the most important purpose yet to date. And you're greater, not because you're better or God loves you more, but you live in a more important time with a more important purpose. There's other proof of this. How about John chapter 20, 27 through 29? That's Thomas. He gets a bad rap, doubting Thomas. Thomas gave his life as a martyr all the way across the world because Thomas believed. But when he touched his hands and feet, he fell down on his knees and he said, my Lord and my God. And he said, blessed are you, Thomas, because you believe because you touched my hands and feet. But get this, but more Blessed are those who have not touched my hands and feet and still believe. You see, what God has always wanted, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. And do you know why the time in which we live? We live in the great age. We live in the fulfillment of give, what gives God what it wants. You realize that your faith is probably as great or as significant as anyone, including Abraham. Abraham had faith, but God spoke to him directly. You have faith, which is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Your faith is as pure as it can be because there is no proof. There's just evidence. You have to choose it. I mean, in the time of Jesus, people saw miracles. Great. Was that faith as pure as a faith, faith that all you have is faith? You realize that's the era we live in. We live in the era of faith. And faith is the one thing that pleases God. And we just have bushel baskets of it. In fact, we are pure faith. That's all we are. We don't have prophecy. We have the Bible that is evidence for our faith, but we don't have the prophecy. We don't have the speaking in tongues. We don't have prophets walking around. We don't have direct revelation from God, communication from God. All we have is the most pure thing that God was building up to through the whole saga of mankind. We live in the age of faith. 
and we don't have miracles, I am so glad we don't have miracles. Because miracles are inferior to what we have, which is providence. Miracles? Miracles had to be given to those who couldn't handle just faith. Right? Because you remember the Israelites? Think anybody saw miracles like they did? How about plagues? Walking across the sea on dry ground. So it produced a lot of faith in them, right? Two million of them leave Egypt. How many were faithful 40 years later after they were literally fed by miracle every day for 40 years? How many of them were faithful enough to enter the promised land? Two. How effective is miracle in producing faith? It's not. How about Jesus? How many were there at the cross? Again, remarkably two. Out of all the people. You understand? Miracles don't produce faith. Miracles are only for the purpose of saying the person doing the miracle is God's spokesman. You need to listen to him and have faith in what he says. That's the only purpose of miracles. But God doesn't want us to have miracles now because God wants the pure faith. Now, that doesn't mean God's not working providentially, subtly. But the beautiful thing about providence, you can still see God's working, but you can only see it through faith. Because the skeptic will say, well, that's not... That's not God, that's just happenstance. But you only see it through the lens of faith. We're out of time today. Again. But you know what? We'll get as far as we can tomorrow. Didn't talk much about the devil, but a little bit, so it still qualifies. So um, come back tomorrow, we'll talk about it more. I appreciate your time and attention. Well, it's got soup with hot dogs in it. Yes. Oh, it had onions and stuff in it, but it was, the main meat was hot dogs. Yeah, it was an evangelism thing, and I, I said that he was, I had the weirdest feeling about this guy. Um,